today uh, I'm Hiran and uh, I work part-time as a software developer and part-time annoying my colleagues by singing songs in the office time. Uh, but the most of the things that I do is I build data-centric products, so I use a lot of data and then build some meaningful product out of it. And today I'm going to talk about neural networks. Just a disclaimer, neural network as such has nothing to do with neuroscience. So if you guys are thinking, oh man, these guys are going to bore us with all the neuroscience things, no, that's not going to happen. Uh, I'm the, like, the key here <laughs> to break this chain of neuroscience here. Um, so neural networks. Let's, let's see like, what cool things happened in the last five years, right? Uh, our facial recognition technology has improved a lot. Like with the new iPhone X now, with the glasses, without the glasses, you can see whether it's me or it's my another neighbor who wants to steal my phone. Uh, another thing is, how many of you play computer games here, online games like Dota or Computer Strike? No one? <laughs> Come on, guys. All right. So the guys who, uh, who plays the computer games, or you might have heard it in the news, like AlphaGo beating like actual human. And there are many interesting bots that are also being developed and it's very fascinating like how a computer can generate so much intelligence as that of a human even beat him in his own case. Uh, on the serious notes or the more uh, for the humanity's sake aspect is like cancer detection and the prognosis uh, just by looking at the images of the cancer or the scanning your certain body tissues. So in this case like skin cancer or this is very cool guy. So he's like the head of the MIT Media Lab. He lost his both legs and then now he built this advanced prosthetics. Uh, so these both legs, oh, he's intelligent beauty. So like, oh, I should use the technology to get me the two new legs. And uh, these legs are even much more efficient in doing uh, very good uh, deeds for the people who have lost the arms, especially in the military things. The, all of these things are influenced by one specific principle, and that particular technique we call neural networks. The either subset of the problem are being solved by neural networks, or like the whole uh, scheme of things are being realized with the help of neural networks. So let's see what the neural network is. So neural network is a technique that we talk a lot about when we talk about machine learning. Okay, there's another bu uh, buzzword, machine learning. So let's look at this, what machine learning is first to understand what neural network is. So in machine learning, there are two pillars, data and your computer program. So what we need is like we have certain set of data or certain type of data, and we want to make computer programs using this data to solve one specific problems or some specific set of problems. They can be real life situations or they can be just like one specific goal that you want to set up. And one of the other terms is when you look at the facial recognition technology, so you can recognize different patterns using the data. Uh, medical diagnosis as we already established in the cancer research. And speech translations to the people who cannot uh, see the things they can uh, like especially for the blind people so they can just show go around with their phone and they can already say okay I'm on the road here's a cat here's a dog and uh, another image recognition so let's look at this video the another cool thing happened uh, recently was Google self-driving cars so this autonomous driving so let's jump to this and uh, see so here you can see like on the left hand side is the camera view how a person looks at the road. And that's how a computer is looking at the road. There are two interesting things happening here. The computer knows that, okay, there are different objects on the street, meaning the cars or the cars coming from the upcoming traffic. It's also recognizing its trajectory on the road. And it's also classifying that it's a car, it's a red light, and these are the human beings going off like this uh, in these yellow boxes here. So what is tried to do here, and this is really, it's very complex, but as a very specific set of problems that it's also solving, is classification. It's classifying the different entities around in the environment as like car, or it's a human being, or it's an other car, or it's a traffic signal. So that's what we call as a problem of classification. 
So this looks pretty complex. So let's have a very much simpler example to see how this classification is being achieved through neural networks. So for this, we will take dogs and the cats. On the left hand side, that's my dog, and on the right hand side is Victoria's cat. So what we want to do, typically, we want to give a picture to our computer program, and computer program will tell us whether it's a cat or it's a dog. Of course, with certain probability. Uh, if it will show me, then maybe it will also tell like it's a dog, but no. Uh, <laughs> we should keep it like, okay, no, it's a human being. Uh, all right, so let's see that how neural network is. So just consider that you give image, this is a mean cat image, you give to a computer program, which we call the black box right now, just for the sake of simplicity. And it will give us the output, whether it's a dog or it's a cat. Simple, right? Let's open this black box now. Before doing that thing, come on, go ahead, yeah. Let's see what it means like giving an image to a black box. It's like, am I like a postman and going like delivering like, hey, here's an image black box and give me the output, like whether it's a cat or a dog. So computer sees the things in numbers. So let's look at this example of 28 by 28 pixel image of number eight. And as you can see, it's made up of different pixels. And each pixel is represented by a number for computer. So computers are pretty dumb, so don't, don't get me wrong. So they don't know whether it's a number eight or something. They need to know how this eight can, they can do computations on it. So you can see like it's uh, various, the black things is all zeros, and depending on the contrast of the image, there are different weights associated here. So you can also see a number eight here, but yeah, computer sees it like this. All right, now we know how the computer sees our image in the form of pixel. And now another important property here happening is every pixel is contributing something as a property of the image. And we call this in the process as features of your data. So this is all the pixels here are the features of your data. So all right. So before going and really like unveiling and opening up the black box, let's see why they are called neural networks. Like it's so confusing name. Can computer scientists come up with like some much more intelligent and creative way for it? Actually, it turns out that in 1970s this idea and the motivation came from the human brain itself. I'm not going to talk about human brain, and if I talk, then I'm sure the neuroscientists will kill me, because I don't know anything about human brain. But just for the sake of the motivation, as if Kenny already established, there are certain regions of the brain, they are meant to focus on certain specific tasks. And for example, if I'm looking at a dog, then it's triggering certain neurons in my brain, and these neurons are further on triggering, and then I'm getting a perception, oh, it's a dog, or it's a human being. Uh, another thing here happening is, not all the neurons, like this mishmash happening into our brain, are connected to each other. Few neurons are connected to some certain set of neurons, and even these neurons, when we are recognizing it's a dog or it's a cat, they not all are like being, our brain is not like, <sighs> Oh, it's a dog. No, it's not happening. It's just a specific set of region in your human brain which is helping you to recognize that it's a dog. Uh, so these things we took into consideration as a motivation for our neural network. So now let's see like, how can we create some sort of a neural network which imitates the behavior how our brain is imitating. So that's how a very simple structure of neural network looks like. There is an input layer, there is an output layer. These are the simplest things to understand here. So what the input layer is, you see our image, it has 784 pixels. So in the input layer, every node is representing one neuron. Again, we are very creative, we took the word neuron from the uh, neuroscience here. And every node is representing a neuron, and it's representing one pixel value. So if you have 784 pixel, if your image is much bigger, then every node here is basically considering the value which is coming as an input for one particular set. 
Our output is very simple. It's binary, dog or a cat. It's not like dog, cat, and zebra, right? So it's only dog and the cat. And then in the middle are the hidden layers. So hidden layers are looks pretty complex and complicated. They are nothing. Uh, you choose them before doing anything further when you're making a structure of your neural networks. You say like, I need on a few more layers of computation and uh, every layer you can decide like number of neurons. But there's one interesting thing happening which is not happening in the human brain. Every neuron is connected with every other neuron. So now the question is, for a neural network to be intelligent, what we need to do. Simply what our brain is doing is the same thing we need to do. We need to find those meaningful connections between the neurons from one layer, from our input data, means our mean cat image coming, to the output layer, we're saying like, yes, it's a cat. We all need to find these combinations of connections and give them like certain advantage and certain weight so that at the end, when we converge this whole network, it gives us our respective outcome. So this is the very basic state of a neural network. Nothing is, it's very dumb right now. It's giving 50-50% probability like it's a dog or it's a cat. But when you start giving him and feeding him more data, then it starts making a shape, getting a shape out of it. So for an example, we call this as training. So we are training our neural network like in the gym. So in the gym for this neural network is the images. You are telling the neural network, hey, it's my mini cat. It's a cat, and this is an image of a cat. That's it. So, and then neural network said, oh, wow, wonderful. My input layer, everything, chuck, 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 chuck. And they started to do these computations. I can go a bit more deeper into this, but I think the, in very simple terms, what is happening here, there are different weights assigned to the, each connection between neurons. So you can see it's 0 0.7, it's 1.2, whilst few weights are very low. So it's exactly like we are dropping these connections. Their contributions is not that much high in recognizing whether it's a cat or it's a dog. And then at the end, here are like whether it's a cat, then this will be the output, or it's a dog, then this will be the output. So, and we do this for every image, so more the image, merrier your model will be. And at the end, when you give it a new image of a cat, then it detects with certain probability that it's a cat. There are two cool things happening here. What we did in the beginning, we just defined the structure of our neural networks, and neuro, it's just the brilliance of this neural network is, it started to learn on its own. And this is what is happening with every other bigger technology. In autonomous driving, the Google self-driving car is also going through a lot of training phase so that it can really combat in the real life situation. And that's no magic happening here. There's a little bit of magic happening, and that's what, uh, uh, so here is, as you can see again, that all the combinations are being, so not all the neurons connections are effective here, and there are some specific output coming. So this is just a combination of these connections leading to a specific output. So, as I said, in reality, things look a bit different. There are like one layer of neural network to the another layer, to the another layer, to the another layer, where which the new term they evolve right now, deep learning. Uh, so, uh, it's, uh, as you can see, in the first level of the neural network, we are just looking at the contrast of the face, like, okay, what the face looks like. In the second level itself, using the information provided by the first layer of the neural networks, we started to form like, hey, it's an eye here, it's a nose here. So we start to detect even much more concrete feature. And at the end, we started to build like how the whole structure of the face looks like. And then they say like, oh, it's a dog or it's, a, it's me. Or in this case, so like it's a human, like when you are holding your face in front of the camera. Uh, okay. So everything looks cool. So we have neural networks, now the world is our own. So what are the challenges? Challenges is, as some of you might already see, one big challenge is how good your data is. So it's like garbage in, garbage out. If I start uh, giving the picture, uh, mixed picture of uh, me, dog, and the cat, then of course your network, uh, and then you expect the network to give just two output, like cat or dog, 
come on, it's not going to work out in that matter. Second thing is, the more you put these hidden layers that we discussed before, and then one layer giving the data to another layer to the another layer, your training time increased drastically. So sometimes it takes days, sometimes it takes like a few hours to train your model, to train your computer program to do this kind of classification. And let's say you did everything and we all here are brilliant scientists or brilliant people, <laughs> not everybody can be scientists. <laughs> then, then we have this here. So how many of you here think that this is a blueberry muffin and this is a chihuahua? Raise your hand. <laughs> Very good, your neural network is very well trained. Congratulations. So, so, you see like, if your data looks like this, you are screwed. Uh, means, uh, here just, by the way, in this case, uh, neural network successfully was classifying these images as the blueberry muffin and the chihuahua of poor chihuahua. But anyway, uh, so you see like, it's pretty complicated. Your data really governs a lot. Uh, with that, I think if you are thinking that whole AI and everything is going to take over the world, hold your horses. There's a long road to go. A lot of, lot of interesting things come with a lot of, lot of work. And we are really behind yet. But maybe in the future we'll see this kind of conversation when robots is saying like I'm replaced by a human being, not the other way around. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> So, it's a very funny question uh, when two scientists talk about that I have a neural network with one hidden layer and I'm using logistic regression as a sigmoid function, then technically logistic regression and neural network is the same. One big difference which comes is, depending on your features, the neural network, it's considered it's like it's remembering your data. So when it's making the connections, remembering the connections. Which, so that it means you can also mold it. When your feature size increase, you can mold it. And in other approaches, let's say a very simple example, our linear classifier model is like AX plus BX plus CX plus this goes to D. Then neural network is doing much more intelligently this thing because it's much more less prone to errors as well. So it's not so sensitive to your data. So I'm guessing you are machine learning scientist yourself? No. All right. <laughs> then, I'm sorry. It's Keep just it. like... Oh, I, I got your point, yeah. Go ahead. So, more perfect from limitation, right? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. We can talk about it in my break. I also yeah. have something to contribute. <laughs> <laughs> please, please. Uh, is it possible to uh, control or to observe this learning process so far that you can guarantee a better-free function, for example, in autonomous, uh, autonomous driving? Excellent question. The problem is there is no failure-free function. So you need to know, I mean, like in reality, uh, in design programs, yes, uh, I, you can try to exactly. I know. So what you do technically is, let's say, you have a training phase. So now you have trained your car. You you took the example of the car. If I am not, it's as an example, right? So you train the car on Munich roads, and then you train the car on Indian roads. <laughs> Trust me, it's going to be a different outcome. Why? <laughs> well, there's, well, well, there's nothing wrong with the road itself. It's the wrong with the data that you're feeding to your model. So your model, based on how your training phase was looking like, it tries to imitate the same behavior into the new settings as well. And then it can work, it cannot work. So that's why I say environment also affects a lot how you should train your data. And if you have taken all the consideration into account, then up to certain probability, we can say that it's going to perform well. And of course, with every training phase, you can measure your data with your validation techniques. It's like you can take some of the testing data, put it in the training data, and then see how your model is behaving. And at every phase, you can also control it. Did I answer your question? Thank you. Uh, yeah. One question, please. And there's also an example of the data with the puppies and the cookies. Puppies and the uh, blueberry muffin. I uh, tell them uh, cookies uh, as well. <laughs> 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 so, and did you label that bad training data? Uh, or shouldn't that be very good training data? 
because you actually classify something as uh, Burberry muffin, so it cannot falsely uh, classify that. I would. Exactly. So you got my point. Uh, in that way, I thought that uh, I, why I put that as an example because even if I train my data on dog, like how a normal dog look like and how a normal cat look like, but I didn't give any data about how other things look like, then it will start classifying blueberry muffins as a dog as well. And if some person, I don't know who are the cat lovers and dog lovers, I don't know about it, but let's say if you go into a room and start classifying that, hey, there are all the dogs here while they were all the blueberry muffins, it's not going to be a good thing. So you are absolutely correct here that the, the quality of your data, so the more the features that you can build with your data, the more effective and the more robust and less sensitive it's going to be in the real life situations. So, yeah. so we're going to have a break. Say so thank you to Karen.